Today I want to talk to you about something that I think is really important. It's about understanding scripture from a perspective of who wrote it, who it's written to, under what circumstances, and how it is that we understand and come to the conclusions in our belief system about reading the Bible. Because if you don't read the Bible, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to be vulnerable to all kinds of heresies and false doctrines. And one of the things I wanted to discuss right now is one of the biggest errors is a lot of people... uh, are involved in what I call replacement theology. They do not recognize the validity of a political state of Israel. They think that that's absolutely gone and now irrelevant to the church. And I want to kind of hit this thing in the head because it's a lie. It's a heresy. It's absolutely not true. Israel is still relevant. Let me give you a brief history on this, and that's what this is going to be about. So if you don't like church history, then you can turn it off now or go on to something else. But in the first century, a AD, after the Lord, the church was very well connected to its Jewish roots, okay? And Jesus didn't intend for it to be any other way. After all, remember, he came unto his own, the Jews, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to those that believe on his name. But understand that Jesus was Jewish, born under Jewish law, taught Jewish law to the Jews, and it it's a Jewish story. Go to John chapter four. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman of a different race or a half breed, if you will, uh, salvation is of the Jews. He said, you don't know what you worship. We know we're the Jews. Salvation is of the Jews. So Jesus intended, uh, that scripture be understood. He's the Messiah of the Jews. After all, Jesus is Jewish. And the basis of his teaching is completely consistent with the Hebrew scriptures, okay? He said, don't think that I've come to destroy or abolish the law, but I've come to fulfill it. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but not one single word, not a jot, not a tittle, not a stroke, nothing that's written is going to be erased or removed until all be accomplished. And that's exactly what he did. Now, um, the first revolt was in about 66 AD. Christianity was basically considered part of Judaism. Uh, I can use the word sect, but it really doesn't theologically classify as that. But it was... it. Its roots, its platform, it's Judaism, okay? We are not just the Christian faith. We are the Judeo-Christian faith, despite how some people want to contradict that and argue it. Uh, There is such a thing. Jesus is Jewish. And uh, just as there were Pharisees and Sadducees and Essenes and different groups, okay? But there became a separation between Judaism and Christianity as a result of religious and social differences. So here we go, okay? There were some contributing factors. Number one, the um, Roman intrusion into Judea, okay? They, they eventually uh, brought the widespread Um, acceptance of Christianity by the Gentiles. And this kind of complicated Jewish history with Christianity. The Roman wars against the Jews not only destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, uh, but it also resulted in Jerusalem's relinquishing her position as the center of the Christian faith um, in the Roman world anyway. And then there was the rapid acceptance of Christianity among the Gentiles, which led to a conflict between the church and the synagogue. Okay, Paul's missionary journeys brought, brought the Christian faith to the Gentile world. And as their numbers grew, as the numbers of the Gentiles grew, so did their influence, which ultimately it disconnected Christianity from its Jewish roots. Never the intention, but it happened. Now, many Gentile Christians interpreted uh, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem as a sign that God had abandoned Judaism, okay? And that he had provided the Gentiles freedom to develop their own Christian theology in a setting completely a part of uh, Jewish influence big mistake. Actually, temple worship, um, although the temple was destroyed, it was no longer necessary as the Holy Spirit is now resident. And as Jesus said again in chapter four, probably a good chapter to read of John, uh, the true believers, God, the father is worshiping people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. So it's not a matter about being in a brick and a stone or bowing this way or that way. That's got nothing to do with it. Now, there was another Jewish revolt um, about AD 133 to 135, okay? This was put down by Hadrian. He's a Roman emperor. And if you ever get a chance to walk on Hadrian's wall, do it. It's pretty impressive. Uh, Over in the north of England or the south of 
Scotland. You can argue that later. All right, but uh, theological power and uh, political power moved from the Jewish Christian leaders to the centers of uh, the Christian leadership uh, was moved to places like Alexandria, to Rome, to Antioch, okay, Rome, Catholicism, Roman church. It's important to understand this change because it influenced the early church fathers to make anti-Jewish statements as Christianity began to disconnect itself from the Jewish roots. And anti-Semitism is straight from hell. It's wrong. It's heresy. As the church spread within the Roman Empire, its membership grew increasingly, and they were basically non-Jewish people. They were Greeks and Roman thought, and Greek thought began to creep in, and it completely changed the orientation of biblical interpretation and understanding. It put it in a Greek mindset rather than in a in a Jewish mindset, which is how it was inductively given, okay? Well, this had later resulted in many heresies, some of which the church still practices today. Replacement theology is still among us. Now, once Christianity and Judaism began to um, take the separate paths, well, the split got wider and wider. Judaism um, was considered, le it was legal uh, under Roman law, and uh, while Christianity at that time was a new religion, it was considered illegal. And we all know the story of the persecutions and the martyrdoms of the Christian by Rome and by the Roman Catholic Church as well. Um, the new religion, Christianity, was illegal, but as Christianity grew, the Romans really tried to suppress it. They tried to get rid of it. They persecuted them, and even some of the apologists uh, they tried in vain to convince Rome that Christianity was just an extension of Judaism. It's really fine, but it's more than just, just an extension. It's a fulfillment. So Rome didn't buy it. They weren't convinced. And the resulting persecutions and the frustrations of the Christians, it uh, turned into animosity against the Jewish community, which they were, uh, they could worship freely as a Jew, but Christians were being, you know, burned at the stake and all that. Well, later when the church became the religion of the state, which you can read about in history, it would pass laws against the Jews in retribution, okay? You played while we burned, now we're going to play while you burn, okay? Doesn't sound very Christian because it's not. By this time, you have politicians involved in institutional religion, okay? It's got nothing to do with God, God's heart, God's attitude, God's spirit. You have people running the church, and it's nasty. These people are wicked, okay? So the antagonism of the Christians towards the Jews was reflected in the writings of the early church fathers. For instance, Justin Martyr in uh, 160 AD, he said to the Jewish people, he said, the scriptures are not yours, but ours, speaking of himself as a Christian. Irenaeus, when he was bishop of Lyon, in um, AD 177, he said that the Jews are disinherited from the grace of God. And Tertullian, he was like AD 160 to 230, he said in his treatise, which is titled Against the Jews, he announced that God had rejected the Jews in favor of the Christians. Well, this is not getting off to a good start, okay? In the fourth century, um, Eusebius wrote that the promises of the Hebrew scriptures were for Christians and not for Jews, and that curses were upon the Jews. He argued that the church was the continuation of the Old Testament, and thus it superseded Judaism. Well, the young church declared itself to be the true Israel, or Israel according to the Spirit, heir to the divine promises. They found it essential to discredit um, Israel according to the flesh. It became important, okay, as it is today. Uh, they wanted to prove that God had cast away his people and uh, he had transferred his love to the Christians instead. And then also at the beginning of the fourth century, there was a, a monumental event occurred um, for the church. It was called the church triumphant. Well, what did they triumph over? They triumphed over the vanquished Israel. Get, uh, I mean, go figure, okay? So were the church triumphant and the poor wallowing Jew in Israel is dead and he's toast because we're the real deal and they're nothing. That's why it's important for you to read your Bible. Because if you don't read your Bible, and these people didn't read the Bible, they were listening to the church councils tell them what to believe. You are totally vulnerable to all of these heresies if you don't read your scripture. Listen, the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. Paul was writing that about Israel according to the flesh. Okay, He would have given himself 
so that Israel, according to the flesh, could be saved. But anyway, um, on with history. In A.D. 306, Constantine uh, became the first Christian, uh, entre comillas, like we say, um, Roman emperor. And uh, he had a rather pluralistic view, according to the Jews. And uh, he gave the Jews um, the same rights as a Christian. And that lasted until about 321 when he made Christianity the official religion of the empire to the exclusion of everything else. You have to believe what I believe, nothing else is accepted. Okay, well, this signaled the end of the persecution for the Christians. That was great, but it was the beginning of persecutions, or I should say the continuation <clears throat> of the persecution against the Jews. So already the uh, church at the council in uh, Elvira, España, Spain, that was in AD 305, the declarations were made. The Jews had to be separated from Christians, okay? The Christians were not allowed to share meals with Jews. They couldn't, uh, they couldn't marry them. They couldn't walk with them. They couldn't talk to them. They couldn't have the Jews bless their fields or their crops, and they could not uh, worship God even on a Jewish Sabbath, okay? So this, this, this is getting, I mean, we're going from the fire to the frying pan here. Something's wrong. And what's happening is we're in a spiritual warfare. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, rulers, principalities, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. So imperial uh, Rome in AD uh, 313 had the Edict of Milan. And uh, that granted favor to Christianity. And it outlawed the synagogues. Yeah, you can be a Christian, but... To hell with the Jews. Let's get rid of the synagogue. So in AD 315, um, another edict, it allowed the burning of Jews if they were convicted of breaking the laws. Okay, so now they're not only is their religion gone and they're discredited and their synagogues need to be knocked over, but we need to burn them as well. Okay, and Christianity was becoming the re religion of the state and further laws were passed against the Jews. Okay, the things that were granted to the Jews previously we're gone now. Um, rabbinical jurisdiction was abolished or at least severely curtailed. Uh, it, it was made punishable by death and uh, Jews were excluded from, you know, just like the 109 other places from uh, AD 250 where Jews were excluded. They can't be teachers. They can't be doctors. They can't be lawyers. They can't uh, hold a high office in a uh, military and uh, these and other restrictions, it just confirmed over and over again by various church councils for the next thousand years, you know, long live the, the Roman popes and the Holy Roman Empire. And, but here we have um, a prelude in AD 321, Constantine decreed that all business should cease on the honored day of the sun, not the S-O-N, but the solar ball of fire, gas, hydrogen he, it, it, in the sky. It is, it is the S-U-N, which we call Sunday, okay? So he was the culprit that substituted Sunday for the Sabbath, for Saturday. Um, and I'm not an Adventist. I'm not a Seventh-day guy. I think you should worship God. If you want to pick a special day, fine. If you want to worship him every day, fine. He's worthy, okay? But... Um, he further advanced the split when that happened, okay? So the Jews had their Shabbat or their Sabbath or their Saturday and Christian Sunday. And uh, this was a controversy among many, even the, um, the Council of Nicaea, which was like AD 325. And, uh, but they ended up concluding that Sunday is the day that worship or the day of rest for Christians, okay? But like I said, it was debated long after that. So... Um, Overnight, Christianity was given the power of the imperial state. The emperors begin to translate the concepts and claims of the Christian theologians against the Jews. And uh, this was really bad. Instead of the church taking opportunity to spread the gospel message, the love of God to the Jews, it became the church triumphant, ready to vanquish all the Jews off of earth. Okay, now, this is not being led by your layman, by the simple person who committed his life to Christ. These are political political leaders who are running the church now, okay? Don't forget, kings can't be crowned uh, without the consent of the Pope. The divine right of kings is going on. All kinds of uh, very pagan primitive ideas are still happening. Okay, but um, after 321, the writings of the church fathers changed really in character, and uh, it 
it wasn't defensive and apologetic, but it was aggressive, nasty, full of venom, okay? Anybody outside the flock, uh, in particular the Jewish people, but they went after real Christians, they went after uh, gypsies, they went after anybody who wasn't what they are. Rome probably, the Roman Catholic Church probably executed a minimum of 60 million people. I mean, they went after everybody who wasn't them. And uh, uh, that's 10 times, more than 10 times what Hitler, you know, did in the Holocaust against the Jews. So it was during this period that we find a lot of examples of uh, anti-Semitic literature is coming out. And it's written by the church leaders, um, Hilary of Poitiers in AD 291 to 327 said the Jews are a perverse people. They're a curse by God forever. And then Gregory of uh, Nicaea, um, he was the Bishop of Cap. Cappadocia. And uh, he, he said the Jews are a brood of vipers. They're haters of goodness. And then wonderful Saint Jerome, he described the Jews as um, serpents wearing the image of Judas. Their psalms and their prayers are the brain of donkeys, he said. So at the end of the fourth century, the Bishop of Antioch, who was uh, John Chrysostom, he was um, a real great speaker, a prolific writer, and he started writing sermons against Jews. He had seen Christians talking with Jewish people, and he's going to stop all this stuff, okay? So he comes out with a series of sermons, <clears throat> excuse me, in an effort to bring his people back to what he called the true faith. So Jews became the whipping boy for his sermon. And uh, to quote the synagogue is, uh, uh, he said that the synagogue is not only a brothel and a theater, it's a den of robbers and a lodging of wild beasts. And uh, he made a lot of accusations against the Jews, how they kill and maim other people. So one can easily see that the Judeo-Christian uh, who wanted to hold on to his heritage or learn um, about Judaism, if he was a Gentile, he was really discouraged from doing that, okay? He would have found it extremely difficult to do so. So there was writings of people that it, it, it was just a very anti-Semitic time um, of church history, okay? The statement was that the Jews had been abandoned. There is no um, expiation possible for them. But here we go. In the fifth century, um, the burning question was, if the Jews and Judaism uh, were cursed by God, then how come they're still around, okay? And Augustine, great Augustine, who people love, admire, and think he's great, um, he said a few great things, but basically, don't believe what Augustine says, okay? He tackled this issue in his sermon, which was titled, get a load of this title. How'd you like to hear this? Today, we're going to preach about Sermon Against the Jews, that is an Augustinian document, Sermon Against the Jews. Well, he asserted that even though the Jews deserve the most severe punishment for, get this, having put Jesus to death, they've been kept alive by divine providence to serve together with their scriptures as witnesses to the truth of Christianity. So their existence was further justified by... Um, by the service they rendered to the Christian truth in attesting through their humiliation uh, because the church had triumphed over the synagogue. And uh, so they were a slave, a servant, or a witness people who had been humbled as a testimony that, yea, were the ones as Christians that have the truth. The Jews are rejected by God. So the monarchs of the Holy Roman Empire thus regarded the Jews as, you know, serfs and slaves and, and utilized them as slave librarians. Um, they also used them in money lending because money lending or usury was considered very dangerous for a Christian for his salvation because the scripture speaks against it. So the way they got around it is they put Jews in charge of lending and giving money and borrowing and setting interest and all that stuff because they figured, well, the Jewish soul is lost anyway, so it really doesn't matter. Why don't we just use them uh, to make money? And therefore, you see how they found their way into fields of banking and commerce and, and things of that nature. So by the Middle Ages, the uh, ideological arsenal of Christian anti-Semitism was completely established. And this was further manifested in a variety of precedents set events within the church, such as uh, Patriarch Cyril, the Bishop of Alexandria, expelling the Jews and giving their property to Christian mobs. Um, and from a social standpoint, the deterioration of the Jewish position in society was only the beginning of its decline. This is the earlier period. 
you get a phobia here that's just exploding. And uh, at first it starts around the clergy who are controlling the people. And then it gets into the ranks of the people because they're trying to learn stuff, you know, from higher up. And then uh, you get anti, you, you get, you end up in church history. You have crusades uh, where, yes, the Muslims had uh, started in aggression. Battle of Hastings was the first, um, I say 1066 Battle of Hastings was the beginning of the Crusades because I've been to, <laughs> I've been to the palace in Sherwood Forest, which was built in 1066, and it's got the statue of Robin Hood and all that stuff out there. And I know why that was built by Richard the Lionhearted, and I know how he died in the Crusades that he went on. Um, a lot of people that I hear, they say, you know, the Crusades started in 1090. I, I, I don't know. I say 1066, but I'm not a true historian anyway, so, so you know, don't take it to the bank. But the Jews were, um, the Jews had a rough time. Under Hitler, they had to distinguish or mark themselves by wearing stars. Um, they were ostracized as communities separated into ghettos. Um, there were all kinds of problems which really culminated in a, I hate to say it, but, quote, Christian, close quote, Europe. There was a Holocaust that took place. And I know the Aryan thinking of Hitler, and I've read Thus, thus Saith Zorathustra, and I know the intellectual basis, uh, base for Nazi intellectualism, and I've, I've done uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, and I've, I've been there and done that. Uh, but Europe was culturally Christian according to what the rest of the world was thinking, okay? And here we are not understanding, not understanding the olive tree from the beginning, okay? If we had understood the clear message of being grafted as Gentiles into the tree from the beginning and the Jews were broken off, uh, the warning is very clear. Don't boast yourself saying, well, they were broken off so we could be grafted in. Uh, you know what, Paul uh, says, take heed lest you fall. God can break you off a lot easier than he can break off the natural branches. So don't get heady and high-minded about that. So, but the church um, had violated God's word concerning the Jewish people in Israel, okay? And we turned the church at that time, the Christian ideology worldview had turned the church into an instrument of hate, of murder, of slaughter, of holocaust, of everything instead of love. But in, uh, in the prophet Micah, he says, but in, in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills um, and the people shall flow into it. All the nations of the earth will come and say, come, let us go into the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. Okay, so Jacob was before it was changed to Israel. So I want to be very clear here that we're talking about a Davidic throne. We're talking about a city called Jerusalem that's on the hill on the sides of the north. We're talking about um, an actual physical Jewish place in the Middle East that exists now. And Jesus is coming back there. I mean, I don't care what you think. Jesus is coming. He's going to set foot on the Mount of Olives. It's going to split asunder. There's going to be, uh, well, the poor Antichrist and the poor false prophet at that time. I wouldn't, but that's a message for another day. But Jesus is not fooling around. He's coming to destroy his enemies. And so he's going to set up and the law shall go forth out of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So friend, I want you to understand that Jerusalem, Israel, is here to stay. We, yes, by faith, we have appropriated and taken all the benefits uh, that were promised to Abraham in the covenant. We are the church. We are the children of God. The body of Christ is the temple of God. All those analogies are fine. You can draw all those. The one thing you cannot do is say that our position is to the exclusion prophetically, scripturally, biblically. Um, you can't exegese that from the Bible at all, that the physical Israel is no longer relevant. My friend, they are God's timepiece. They are, they are the clock on earth. Watch, pray, pray, for, <laughs> pray for the peace of Jerusalem, seriously. Um, so let's just understand that don't buy replacement theology. Don't curse the Jews. It's not a good idea, okay? Bless God's people and be thankful that he chose them, not because of virtue. It's like Mary. Mary wasn't chosen because she was special, but she was special because she was chosen, okay? The 
God chose through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, through David, through his covenants to identify himself when God came in the flesh as the Messiah, the Savior of the world, so we could recognize, hey, it's not Brother Salvatore over in New Jersey who, who's, who's here to save the world. We've got thousands of years of Scripture to confirm that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures.